Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Captain Marvel just dropped a new trailer that finally shows us what brings a smile to Carol Danvers' face. Going Super Saiyan and blowing up a bunch of stuff in space! By the way, can we lay off Brie Larson's facial acting? She's got gross bluish blood on it. That's never fun. That's really gross. Let's break down this trailer frame by frame for all the interesting details that you might have missed. And spoiler warning in case any of the predictions I make end up being right. I actually think I might be onto something really crazy in this. And if it ends up being right, I don't want you to blame me for not warning you. So, warning. Okay, let's get started. So, scrolls are the bad guys. This trailer opens by returning to the standout moment from the first trailer, Carol Danvers' elder abuse. Look, I don't care what kind of subway dance or parkour this whole lady does after, you just know that some of these commuters are like, that young woman in armor just assaulted a very durable grandma. During this fight, voiceover from Nick Fury explains the whole setup. Two alien races, Kree and Skrull, they're at war, Earth has ended up in the middle of it. Now the Skrull are shapeshifters, and this trailer confirms that this old woman is indeed a Skrull imposter. Actually, pay close attention, you can hear this woman growl after being hit. And of course, the metal pole dents after she runs into it, suggesting she's super strong. By the way, this is all taking place in mid-90s Los Angeles, a train that's from the then recently completed LA Metro lines. Let's move on. And you're a Kree, a race of noble warriors. Heroes, noble warrior heroes. Here, the conversation continues over a shot of Carol boarding the train. Look closely at the roof there. Apparently, someone smashed through it. So that's how all the holes in LA's trains got there. You'd think they would've fixed them by now. And we see young Nick Fury and Carol in the car, where Carol identifies as a Kree, the good guys in this galactic conflict. Actually, listen to how absolute her tone is. Heroes. Noble warrior heroes. I don't know. To me, this sounds like the kind of bold declaration that a character makes in the first act of a movie just to have it completely upended later on. Like, we know from the comics that the Kree aren't exactly that noble. They're pretty cold-hearted and militaristic. Really just a shade less crappy than the Skrull are. So this little smile here, along with Carol's heroic swagger that we see as she walks up with her Star Force guys, I think this will be the major thing that changes throughout Carol's arc in this movie. By the way, just to remind you, the Star Force is kind of like the Kree SEAL Team Six. It includes Carol, who actually goes by Vers on this Kree homeworld of Hala. There's also Korath, Jaimon Hansu's character from the Guardians of the Galaxy. This is long before he gets radicalized and splits off with Ronan the Accuser, who's also in this movie. You can also see Minerva, that's Gemma Chan's character. She's a Kree geneticist. Atlas, Captain Atlas in the comics. He's played by Aljanes Perez Soto. And Bronchar, played by Runa Tempta. Let's move on. Your life began the day it nearly ended. We found you. With no memory, we made you one of us. So you could live longer, stronger, superior. Okay, this section is probably the most mysterious that we've seen from this movie yet. So we're introduced to Annette Benning's character. She's an important Kree figure who explains to Carol how she came to join them. She says that they found her when she was nearly dead and that she had no memory and that they rebuilt her so that she can live longer, stronger, and superior. But here's the thing, anyone who actually describes their race with the word superior is probably an a-hole. And her words are also super confusing because they kind of contradict Predict the imagery that we see. Like, if we were to assume that the Kree saved Carol Danvers from this freak accident, later infusing her with this blue-green Kree blood to heal her injuries, why does she appear to already have this bluish-greenish blood coming from her nose at the crash site, the moment that she gets exposed to this alien tech? Also, briefly, you can see a figure in green Kree armor walking up to Carol as she lies in the dirt. I suspect this is Jude Law's character, whose name Marvel still has yet to release to us. We had first thought that he was playing Marvel, that's Carol Danvers' Kree predecessor who gave her her powers, but all the secrecy around his name has led to speculation that he could be Yon Rog, Captain Marvel's recurring nemesis from the comics. Also, notice this place where Carol and Annette Benin's character are standing. It's some vast room with interesting lights and holographic shapes shining all around it. This movie, Captain Marvel, is clearly all about memories. I'm thinking this could be some kind of memory recreation chamber, something like Tony Stark's barf technology. And like barf, 
I think we should remember that these memories are not objective reality. They can be subjective, false memories. I'm just saying we shouldn't trust Benning's character 100%, and I'll actually piece together my theory for how I think everything went down in just a bit. But in fairness, we should say this Cree lady does give us one clear answer to a question that we've had. Notice how she says Carol will live longer. That explains why Carol's aging process is so slow. Like why she appears to be the same age when she returns to Earth, and why she will probably look the same in the present day in the next Avengers movie. And after Verse fires energy blasts from her fists as a member of the Star Force, we move on to the next clip. You were reborn. I keep having these memories. Something in my past is the key to all of this. Here we see this same shot of Carol upside down that we saw in the last trailer, but now a wider anger reveals a scroll on the far left. Now this is interesting. Before I speculated that this could be Carol having false memories implanted in her mind by the Kree, but now I'm thinking that she's with the scroll and they're trying to extract memories from her mind. Like maybe that is how Talos seems to know her origin. Like he conceived this fractured memory from her mind and he reassembled it into a clear narrative for everyone to understand. Perhaps Carol surrendered herself to the scroll so that they could help her out this way. Like she's playing both sides. Really, I think this is going to be the big drive for Carol in the movie. To piece together her past and distinguish between which memories seem real and which could have been implanted by the Kree to reprogram her into a super soldier. Interesting detail here, look closely at these memory flashes. Little girl Carol is lying beside someone in a striped shirt and that same shirt is on the person go-kart racing with her when she's a bit older. This could be her father who has very limited shirts or this could be a kind of matrixy implanted memory man. But instead of the woman in the red dress, it's the man in the striped shirt. Now, another memory features Carol as a pilot flashing the sign to her friend, Maria Rambeau, call sign Photon. She is actually the mother of Monica Rambeau from the Marvel comics. Monica goes by the hero name Photon. She also actually takes on the Captain Marvel mantle herself at one point. Now, Carol's patch here says United States Air Force Test Pilot School. That's located at Edwards Air Force Base in the desert in Southern California. It's actually where the Air Force tests out experimental aerospace tech. I'm thinking Carol and Maria are testing out some new secret Air Force tech, and that could be what leads to Carol's run-in with the Kree and her whole accident. We also see more of Carol's foot chase with that scroll on the train. Here she blasts him, and right before he gets lit up, you can see him in red ducking under the train tunnel. I assume this is right before he turns into that sweet old lady. Let's move on. You know how to fly this thing? We'll see. That's a yes or no question. Yes. Okay, in this section, Nick Fury and Carol Danvers visit some military hangar. But these jets look kinda crazy and techy and sci-fi-y. Fury is clearly shocked that Carol knows how to operate this jet. And when it flies out of the hangar, look closely. That looks like the 90s prototype Quinjet, an early model of the one that the Avengers later used. But also check out the hole that it flies out of. Whatever that is, that's gotta be super secret. Like most air bases are located on flat terrain. Like they don't require pilots to land in and take off from bat cave style cliffside entrances. This theory has come up before, but I'm thinking this could be Area 51 or like some fictional version of it. Like maybe Fury takes Carol here to try to learn about her past as an Air Force test pilot. And while she's there, she recognizes classified aircraft that's parked there. And if you look closely at the controls on the dash, you can actually see its previous heading, speed, and altitude. Its heading or compass direction is 20.6 degrees, meaning that the jet was flying north, northeast, and it was traveling roughly the cruising speed and altitude of commercial jetliner. Does this tell us anything about what happened to Carol? Uh, well, not yet. You just wait. These stats are gonna come in handy. Next clip. Would you like to know what you really are? I think I had a life here. What aren't you telling me? Okay, here we start with a shot of three alien warships. Now I actually think these are scroll because it's actually the same shot as one that we saw earlier where a Kree ship was speeding down to the planet's surface. You can actually see that same ship now in this shot. It's a tiny dot closer to the surface. Perhaps it's being chased by these scroll ships. And next we see Vers with her Kree helmet fading off her face and it lets her mohawk ponytail fall down. So awesome. This technology actually looks almost exactly like the kind of tech that Star-Lord Peter Quill uses to activate and take 
take off his mask. I'm thinking that he's using Cree tech for that. Also, look at the wall behind Carol here. Looks like there's some bluish greenish blood splattered on it. Carol may be walking into a Cree bloodbath here. Now this section also takes us back to that cryptic crash site memory. And again, the imagery is so super crazy. This shot of the explosion has a strange lens flare. If you look closely, you can see hexagonal or maybe they're pentagonal shapes. They're lit up, almost as if this could be a projected memory from those lights that we saw back in Annette Benning's room. There's a lot more bluish greenish blood, which again, shouldn't be there if Carol hasn't been infused with Cree blood yet. And there's this mysterious silhouette figure coming through the smoke. Carol gazes at it, confused, and then it appears to be a scroll attacking her. But, 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 but. remember earlier, there was that other angle of the scene, but taken out of Carol's point of view, it depicted this figure as a green Cree armored figure. So here is what I think is going on. I think U.S. Air Force pilot Carol Danvers broke formation upon seeing a UFO and she chased it down and then she got mixed up in a Cree squirrel dogfight. She ends up crashing and she gets exposed to some radiation that gives her powers. Maybe this was from some weapon or technology that the two sides were fighting over. The Cree, Jude Law's character, sees this and then they decide decide to recruit kidnap Carol and use her as a super soldier. They wipe her memory and then replace it with false memories. Memories that demonize the scroll, make her hate the scroll, make her really good at killing the scroll. It's kind of like that episode of Black Mirror where soldiers are programmed to see certain people as monsters. That could explain why these various shots of the crash site have these inconsistencies. I think this memory is going to be key to this movie. I have a feeling Carol's gonna revisit it over and over and over again. It's a crucial formative moment and she's gonna try to piece together the mystery here, with all the details in the memory changing because many of them could have been implanted fake ones. I think ultimately Carol's gonna figure out this conspiracy by looking at old classified records of her time as a test pilot, and maybe by talking with the scroll, ultimately leading to her refusal to fight in the Kree scroll war anymore, and instead to end it, to keep Earth out of this war. Fun detail here, notice that when she goes through her belongings, there's her old dog tag, and it's been broken in half right at Carol Dan, with the other half presumably having Vers on it, D-E-R-S. That's the origin of her Cree name. I suppose this is a Marvel version of Marty McFly's mom thinking his name's Calvin Klein because it's written on his underwear. But let's move on. You've come a long way, but you're not as strong as you think. This war is just the beginning. I'm not gonna fight your war. In this section, we see more memory flash montages that we saw in the first trailer with parallel moments from Carol's life syncing up. All the moments she fell, all the moments she dusted herself off and got back to her feet. Actually, when she falls off the bike, look at those cars behind her. The VW bus and the others look like models from the late 60s, maybe early 70s. This would establish Carol's disappearance in the mid to late 80s and her time away from Earth as about a decade. Jude Law's character lectures her back on Hala, and you could see that one of those Cree infusion ports from her arm that we saw earlier, it's also on her neck. Perhaps Perhaps this is the place that they upload those false memories. It's kind of like the plugs that they use in the Matrix. We also see Carol in her new red and blue suit, which I assume that she takes on after breaking away from her Kree loyalties. The facility that she's in, busting up, must be controlled by humans. Like notice that foosball table broken there. I think the guys that she's taking out are shield soldiers. They're dressed in that old school black uniform that we saw in concept art for the shield soldiers. We get a new close-up of Talos with the voice of Ben Mendelsohn that we've been hearing throughout the trailer, along with a shot of Ronan from Guardians of the Galaxy observing a space battle. And then we see Talos's human form leading a group of agents into that hangar that we saw earlier. Now Talos works for S.H.I.E.L.D., meaning that the agency has been compromised by scroll imposters, suggesting that this story might be Nick Fury's first rodeo with S.H.I.E.L.D. being overtaken by a hostile influence, this event preparing him for when he and Cap battle with Hydra and Winter Soldier. On to the next clip. I'm gonna end it. Here we see Carol in her full glory. Now this is called binary. In the comics, Captain Marvel taps into the power of a white hole. It's basically the theoretical opposite of a black hole rather than energy and matter going into it. Infinite amounts of energy and matter beam out of it. That's why this blinding white light emits from Carol's body. This is why you keep hearing that Captain Marvel is the most powerful Marvel hero. The ability to go binary makes her more powerful maybe than Thanos or the Hulk. Though we should say that in various incarnations of the comics, their powers are 
or a relative, depending on the situation. So that doesn't mean that Captain Marvel can just like punch Thanos in the balls and be done with it. So I think she's gonna be a pretty big help. Listen to Carol <laughs> declare her intention. I'm not gonna fight your war. I'm gonna end it. To me, this line resonates with the Avengers storyline. One, it sets up Captain Marvel as a hero who ends wars, maybe even infinity ones. But also, this might answer that question of why Nick Fury refused to call Captain Marvel for so long. Like, I've been wondering what sacrifice Carol Danvers would have had to make for Fury to grant her privacy and retirement from superheroing. Maybe 10 years of murdering scrolls for a Kree empire that brainwashed her was enough manipulation for a lifetime. So perhaps out of pity, Fury leaves her with this pager and says, only if the universe depends on it. And of course, we know it's gonna depend on her. Okay, on to this last bit. Ah, aren't you the cutest little thing? Aren't you cute? And what's your name, huh? Gary. What's you? I'll be back. Uh, it turns out Fury's a cat person. Notice the name tag, Goose. Now this is most likely a reference by Carol to the movie Top Gun, which would maybe be the favorite movie of 80s pilot Carol Danvers. Goose was Maverick's buddy and he dies. And I think that dark turn could be foreshadowing an interesting twist for Goose the cat here. You see, in the comics, Carol's cat is named Chewie and it turns out he's not even a cat. Rocket Raccoon points out that he's actually an alien race called a Flurkin, which can actually teleport stuff with little pocket dimensions that they carry, yeah, they're kind of weird. And notice how Goose paws down Fury's hand away from his collar. Maybe that's not a cute little kitty cuddle. It's actually a well-trained animal actor communicating, hey, hands off the merch. I'm just saying, guys, we know this is a movie that we will learn the mystery of how Nick Fury lost his eye. And uh, roll my favorite clip. Last time I trusted someone, I lost an eye. <laughs> and I have never seen Nick Fury trust anyone as much as he trusts this little kitty cat. So you just wait, Goose is gonna claw that eye out. That scratch injury kinda looks like kitty scratches to me. But here's my question for you guys. Assuming that some of Carol's memories are false, which of these memories do you think are real and which do you think could be implanted? Are they all fake? Comment down below with your thoughts and follow New Rockstars on Twitter and Instagram at New Rockstars. And if you like me, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EAVA. Subscribe to this channel for these kinds of in-depth breakdowns of everything Avengers related, news, theories, trailers. We get pretty obsessed here. I guess I've always been this way. You know, even as a kid, wait, oh, that, that memory was implanted. Oh, I'm a mess. <laughs>